permanent fund dividends are going out to Alaskans in coming days, but the governor wants more money added for an additional payment, and lawmakers seem locked up about how to move forward on a plan to stabilize state spending and protect the permanent fund for the future. Why, after years of debate, is it still so difficult to find a solution? We're back with a discussion about the best fiscal way forward today on Talk of Alaska. Talk of Alaska is brought to you in part by the law firm of Landy Bennett Blumstein, attorneys who know people, businesses, tribes, and communities of Alaska. Landy Bennett Blumstein, online at lbblawyers.com. The views expressed on this program are those of the participants and not necessarily those of Alaska Public Media, this station, or its underwriters. Hello, it's Talk of Alaska. I'm Lori Townsend. Lawmakers are in a fourth special session. But even as most say they want a compromise for the future of permanent fund spending, there is still no compromise. There was a Senate Finance Committee bill that aimed to fix the budget gap and protect the PFD for the long term, but it hasn't passed the full Senate. And why it's languishing is part of our discussion today. You can join in that conversation if you'd like. 1-800-478-8255 is the number statewide. And if you're in the local Anchorage area, the number is 550-8422. Here to help us sort of set the scene and understand where lawmakers are currently in the fourth special session is Alaska Public Media and KTOO's Andrew Kitchenman, who covers state government. Hi, Andrew. Hello, Laurie. Thanks so much for being with us today. And in just a few minutes, we'll be joined by some Alaskans who have ideas about how to solve the state's fiscal problems. We'll meet them in a minute. But first, Andrew, thanks for being with us. I know that it's a really busy time for you. So you reported on the start of the fourth special session that started last week and noted that lawmakers did not hold any meetings to discuss the agenda. How unusual is that and what does that signal? It's a little hard to generalize about special sessions because each one's different. Um, Like, for instance, when they're in June, often they're talking about the budget and then you won't have meetings because maybe the budget will be in the conference committee. So it's hard to generalize. But, yeah, to go a week with uh, absolutely nothing, I'm sure disappointed some legislators. Um, Let's see. While the topic of this special session is kind of similar to the first and third special sessions this year, the details are different. Um, in the first special session, the legislature hadn't passed the budget, so, so that wound up becoming a big focus. Uh, the, special, the second special session was held to resolve a dispute that could have led to a partial state government shutdown. And then when the legislature, when the legislature met for the third special session, there was no money for a PFD, and so that took a lot of the uh, energy. Um, As far as what it all signals, um, there are deep disagreements, not just over policy, but also whether it's productive to discuss the proposals that are out there now. Um, Several um, committee hearings were held on bills in the last special session. Um, There isn't a lot of enthusiasm for, for bills right now that are focused on sort of the revenue side. And uh, also on top of all this, House Speaker Louise Stutes has expressed concern about exposing legislators and staff to COVID-19. Hmm. All right. Well, the uh, describe the work in front of them. The governor called for the fourth special session with a list of five items for lawmakers to consider, correct? Yes. Uh, Specifically, the governor's proclamation sets the agenda for any special session for what the legislature can work on if he calls it. And the specific items, some of the items are, are actually are fairly specific. His uh, proposal to pay the difference between what Alaskans are receiving in PFDs this week or starting to receive this week and the amount that they would receive if the state was paying half of all the money it was drawn from the permanent fund this year uh, for permanent fund dividends. Um, that's from permanent, the, the money the state's drawn from permanent fund earnings, I should specify. There's also his two constitutional amendment proposals. One would put the PFD in the Constitution. It would also protect 
the permanent funds earnings reserve account in the Constitution. And also the uh, but the PFP would be paid at this new formula that he's proposed. Uh, the other amendment would lower the state limit on spending uh, that's in the Constitution. Um, there are two more general items on the agenda, and those are bills related to the PFD and related to revenue. And there are several bills out there on both of those issues. Like I said, several odd hearings. Last special session um, hasn't been a lot of support for the larger tax bills, um, which leaves open the question that the states had for really six years, which is how to pay for both the budget and for larger PFDs. Mm -hmm. Andrew, uh, as we know, there was a bipartisan working group. They came up with a compromise over the summer. Why hasn't that advanced? Yeah, the most that's happened with that is there was a presentation from the working group in front of the House Special Committee on Ways and Means, which is a a new committee that's supposed to look at these big issues. Um, The report that they produced hasn't included um, specific bills, um, so it's more general concepts. And within that, there are still major differences. For instance, how, uh, like, will the larger PFD start right away or will they be phased in as the state has more revenue? Um, another big difference is how much revenue is needed. Um, Republicans aligned with the governor um, say it's about $500 million, um, and that would leave about $200 million in spending cuts. And uh, others say that the needed revenue is close to about $800 million. So it's hard to start the work when there are still big differences over fundamentals of taxing and spending. Um, and there's one other thing I'd like to note, which is that the working group uh, appeared to make significant progress on agreeing on what assumptions should go into, uh, like, for instance, how big is the gap that needs to be closed. Um, But there's still questions as to whether those assumptions are a little too optimistic. Uh, For instance, the Dunleavy administration pulled back this weekend on a proposal that would reduce the amount that the state pays for public employee pensions. And um, if that if that holds and and there isn't that reduced amount, then it would reduce it would really increase the long term cost to the state by more than 100 million dollars a year. Mm. All right. Um, A lot to grapple with. Uh, In talking to legislators, do you get a sense that they're earnestly trying to find some consensus? They could have gaveled in and back out and ended the special session, couldn't they? So are they working this week? Um, If they're still in session, uh, what's the tone? Do they have plans to work this week? So... uh Well, I'll start with the different groups of lawmakers. The legislators who are aligned with the governor are eager to pass his constitutional amendments. Uh, At the very least, they want four votes on the the amendments. And they want, of course, they want the supplemental PFD, which would be about twelve hundred dollars beyond what Alaskans are are receiving already. Um, And they also say that the state can afford all of this because of the recent growth in the permanent fund. Among those who aren't aligned with the governor, they're not as eager to spend a lot of time talking about larger dividends if they don't know that the governor will support measures that would both pay for them and balance the budget. Um, They're also unlikely to support floor votes on a PFD amendment uh, with still costs that the legislature hasn't agreed to pay for. And uh, for them, the issue with the supplemental PFD is it would require an unplanned draw from permanent fund earnings. And some are concerned that once the state starts doing that, it it will never stop until there's no money left in the uh, permanent funds earnings reserve. Um, So there isn't consensus. um, But there's also not consensus on gaveling out, at least this first week. Hmm. Um, There will be hearings this week. Uh, The House Ways and Means Committee is scheduled to discuss a bill that would set PFDs at that level that the governor has proposed. uh, excuse, excuse me, uh, the, the bill that they're talking about would set it at about half of what the governor has proposed. Um, but that's roughly what the state could pay without large spending cuts or tax increases. I see. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, and so, Andrew... And then there are other... Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. And, and what, what are you hearing about what might be next if this fourth special session ends without any long-term resolution? Yeah, it must end by November 2nd, and that only leaves a little more than two months before the next regular session. So the governor would have to decide whether to call a fifth special session. I, I'm not sure if that would happen can, if there isn't progress in the fourth. 
Um, legislature is set to surpass its all-time record for days in session this year uh, during this special session. Um, so the legislature could take up similar bills to what the governor wants in the regular session, um, but next year is an election year, which makes it more difficult to pass major legislation. Um, one thing that's worth noting regarding next year's election, every 10 years, voters are asked whether to hold a constitutional convention that could rewrite the state constitution. Uh, that is, that uh, has never passed in 60 years, but uh, supporters of larger dividends say they'll push for one if, if that doesn't happen before then. All right. Well, thank you so much, Andrew, for helping us uh, better understand where we're at right now um, as we move forward in this conversation about uh, the future of the state's fiscal situation. Uh, thanks for having me, Laurie. That was Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Media and KTOO state government reporter. And if you're just joining us, we're talking about Alaska's fiscal future and the debate over the what best path forward. We are now bringing on our guests for today. That is Brad Keithley. Brad is an, an attorney and the managing director for Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Also on the line is Rick Halford. Rick is a former Republican Senate leader and a member of the Permanent Fund Defenders Group. And on the line with us is Cliff Grow. Cliff is an attorney and a, a member of Alaska Common Ground. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for being on today. Thank you, Lori. All right. So let's get started. Uh, and I want to uh, let Alaskans know that you can also join us if you'd like to be in the conversation today. What do you want lawmakers to do to settle the permanent fund debate? Do you think the Constitution should be amended to do this, or should legislators pass bills to do so? Do you think it's possible for dividends to continue and the state budget to be balanced? You can call us at 1-800-478-8255. That's the number statewide, 1-800-478-8255. If you're in Anchorage, the local number is 550-8422, 550-8422. You can also email us, talk at alaskapublic.org. All right. So, um, Brad, I want to start with you. What of the various bills and concepts in front of lawmakers currently do you think could work, or do you think they need to take a completely different track? Brad, are you there? Hmm. Well, maybe we lost him. Um, all right, Cliff, let's go to you, and we'll see if we can get Brad back. You've written extensively on the permanent fund issue and held numerous forums through Alaska Common Ground to hear from Alaskans about it. What's the best resolve from your perspective? Um, Lori, thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, as you know, I'm uh, uh, going to have to catch a plane in about 15 minutes, and I really appreciate uh, uh, being on. Um, what I would say, and from my perspective as citizen Cliff Grow, uh, and speaking for myself, uh, that we need to take a comprehensive approach, as the bicameral bipartisan fiscal plan working group said, and that means addressing um, all the revenue issues and the, and the spending issues simultaneously in terms of what the big picture is. And by spending, I mean the outlays for both the conventional budget, like you know salaries for troopers and teachers and uh, road construction and maintenance. And also for permanent and dividends, which I had a, a major role along with Rick Halpert in, in creating back in 1982. And that means that everybody in Alaska needs to eat both some spinach and some dessert simultaneously. And a lot of people want to go the all dessert route. And uh, from their perspective, of course, one person's dessert is another person's spinach. But in this context, this means that, um, and this is what the, the fiscal plan working group said, you need a comprehensive approach approach which involves both fixing the um, the uh, guaranteeing the and protecting the permanent fund guaranteeing the dividend in the Constitution while simultaneously coming up with the major new revenues between 500 million and 775 million uh, as the member group said uh, per year um, and looking at um, whatever um, budget reductions you're going to make maybe in the context of an additional tight spending cap but it can't just be big dividends with no way to pay for it. Just like, you know, looking at uh, that would be similar to having, you know, uh, the large you know, revenue uh, tax increases 
um, you know, by themselves either. These things need to go together. And people need to think, uh, understand realistically where we are. The oil party is over. The oil money party is over. And, and the state of Alaska's oil revenues have dropped dramatically. Um, and we're now getting most of our revenues for the state budget. And uh, I'm sure general fund, the way people talk about the budget, mostly from the earnings of the permanent fund. And we need to start an endowment state. The endowment's not large enough right now. We have to, uh, you know, deal, you know, deal with the facts as they are before them. As I said, you know, everybody needs to get together and, and eat, like I said, a diet which has both you know, spinach and desserts and things like that. Right. Thank you, uh, Cliff. Brad, I understand we've got you back now. Uh, what of the various bills and concepts in front of lawmakers do you think could work, or or uh, do you think they need to take a completely different approach? But Lori, I think the fundamental problem here uh, that's facing lawmakers is who pays? Uh, who pays the, the, to close the, the deficit? I mean, the oil companies can contribute some through uh, tax adjustments. There's some co- corporate ta- income tax adjustments that can be made. But at the end of the day, individual Alaskans are going to have to contribute in some fashion. And what's gone on is through PFD cuts, we've shifted the burden largely to middle and lower income Alaska families. The top 20 percent are paying a trivial percent toward the, toward the solution, and non-residents are paying zero because we're taking all of the revenue by, uh, by cutting the PFD. I think what we need to do and what the legislature needs to do is is look at it from a from a different perspective. What has the lowest adverse impact? What's the most equitable and what has the lowest adverse impact on uh, on the Alaska economy? Back in 2016, ICER told us, the Institute of Social and Economic Research, the University of Alaska Anchorage told us that PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the overall economy and are the most inequitable, have the largest adverse impact uh, on Alaska families by shifting the burden largely to middle and lower income Alaska families. I think if we start from the principle of what has, what's the most equitable approach and what has the lowest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, we're going to find a solution. A lot of people just jump to saying, oh, it's got to be PFD cuts or it's got to be sales taxes or it's got to be income taxes. Those have different impacts on Alaska families and those have different impacts on the overall Alaska economy. I think the starting point needs to be, let's find what's the most equitable, the fairest across all Alaska families, and let's find what the solution that has the lowest adverse impact on all Alaska families. All one, right. one, Go ahead. One, one, one fact that, 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 that is out there that, that people try to avoid, some people try to avoid, is PFD cuts take three times uh, the amount of money from middle-income Alaska families than they take from uh, uh, th- than they take if we if we used an income tax. An income tax would take only a third as much out of middle-income Alaska families as PFD cuts do. So I think we need I think we need to look at the solutions in terms of what their impact is on Alaska families and what their impact is on the overall Alaska economy. All right, and we'll get into some of those uh, ideas about. Um what is most equitable from uh, our guest's perspective. But I want to remind our listeners that this is Talk of Alaska, and today we are talking about the how to find the best way forward for the state to both uh, stabilize state spending into the future and also protect the permanent fund. And our guests are uh, advocating for protecting the PFD and finding other ways of raising revenue, at least um, so far we've heard that perspective. You can join our conversation at 1-800-478-8255. That's the number statewide, 1-800-478-8255. If you're in Anchorage, the local number is 550-8422, 550-8422. And you can email us, talk at alaskapublic.org. Rick, uh, former Senator Helford, I was reading editorials of yours and, and sometimes together with Clem Tillian, going back to 2016 on this permanent fund debate. In a 2019 ADN editorial, you wrote, a stable and conservative formula for paying the annual PFD needs to be embedded in the Alaska Constitution. So what does that look like from your perspective? What are the amendments uh, the governor has proposed um, the ones that you would want to see enacted? Well, I think the first thing is you do have to reconnect the permanent fund to the people of Alaska. You know, for 35 years, it was clearly connected. Nobody 
really in the uh, political process thought it could be vetoed. Uh, it was vetoed. Uh, the uh, Basically, the uh, recession in the oil industry was spread statewide by that veto, and uh, we've been going downhill ever since. But we're still getting about $14 billion a year uh, in oil production value, and yet the state share is tiny compared to what the original agreements in the development of the oil was. We are a generation that has has spent and used uh, something in the neighborhood of $150 billion in one long generation, and uh, we have an amazing habit of spending our seed corn. I think the the uh, you know the process responds to power, influence, longevity, position, economic power, age. Uh, the dividend itself was just the opposite. By including children, uh, we in fact fed the bottom end and the broad end of the whole economic spectrum. And Mr. Keithley is absolutely right. We chose the absolute worst thing to do. If you look at the impact of the veto and what happened to the permanent fund dividend, uh, you can just take, where did the money go? You know, we spent more than the cut in the permanent fund dividend advocating for a gas line that was going nowhere. Uh, we spent more in the payable tax credits. Uh, we, we spent more in the deductible tax credits. Uh, the ADA excess, the AHFC excess, there are numerous sources inside of the system uh, that were ignored while the dividend was taken away from Alaskans. Uh, I think one of the things that, you know, if you tailored uh, an income tax or a sales tax to target non-resident employment and seasonal employment, you could get at least a quarter of that with no impact on Alaskans. So, you know, you, you have to start with the, the starting point being where we are. We are sadly spoiled. We want uh, to have a big dividend, a big government, and pay nothing. Uh, you know, we look for long-term goals from our legislature, but the rewards and the system are based on very short-term actions. And that's that's sad, but a matter of fact, democracy overrepresents the present and always underrepresents the future. But reconnect the permanent fund dividend, protect inflation proofing, and deal with whatever excess there might be after the permanent fund is made truly permanent by inflation proofing in the Constitution and it is made uh, re responsive to its shareholders through the dividend. Hmm. So individual pieces of that puzzle are less important, but it's very, very difficult to get a legislature that has to face short-term judgment and is expected to stand up for long-term goals. All right. Well, Brad, I'm going to turn back to you. I want you to pick it up there. A year ago, uh, a little more than a year ago, September of 2020, you wrote, again, another ADN editorial, that Alaskans needed to be honest with each other and that spending cuts, a tighter spending cap, new revenue, which translates to new taxes, and a restructuring of the PFD is needed to get solvent. Do you see it the same way today? And what do you want to see first in a restructured PFD? Well, I think it's fair uh, that it's going to take all three. Cliff is Cliff is very uh, eloquent on that, and I think describes it describes it fairly. But at the end of the day, I mean, I, I think what stalls this process out is at the end of the day, we can't decide. Uh, the legislature can't decide how to do new revenues. They can't decide who pays uh, the burden. They can't decide the distribution of the burden. And frankly, I've come to think that resolving that issue. Uh, is is probably the most critical piece to getting everything everything else resolved. If you make all Alaskan families, including the top 20 percent, contribute to the cost of government, I think you're going to see a bigger pushback on spending uh, than you have so far. I mean, right now the top 20 percent 
essentially pay a trivial amount toward the cost of government because the PFD hits them, uh, hits them at a very low rate uh, in, in terms of share of income. And if you engage them, if they have to pay a, a, the same sort of share that they've pushed off on middle and lower income Alaska families, I think you'll see them pushing back on, on spending cuts. So I think that would take care of itself. Uh, the PFD does need to be restructured. The governor's proposed 50-50 POMV, which I think is a fair landing point. It's a 40% cut in the PFD from the current statute based on FY22 numbers, but it's still a fair landing point. But we have to get to how we're going to resolve the third piece of that, the other revenues. Once we do that, and if we do it equi equitably, and if we do it with the lowest possible impact on the overall Alaska economy, I think the other two pieces will come together. All right. And Cliff, uh, I want to go back to you here before we have to take a break in a, a few minutes. You wrote Alaska's Fiscal Crisis, a graphic guide. And within it, you say that a workable plan would involve a constitutional amendment to help keep the permanent fund and the permanent fund dividend permanent, a moderate increase in oil taxes, and a fair, broad-based tax, such as an income tax that would capture income earned in Alaska by non-residents. Are you in favor of the current proposals by the governor for amending the Constitution, or do you want to see something different? Um, I am not in favor um, of having the, the big dividends the jumbo size, I call it jumbo size dividends, in without new revenues to pay for them. And the governor has not proposed new revenues. I think that is a major failure. Um, he should propose new revenues. He keeps saying, you know, said some nice things. The members of the administration said nice things about the bipartisan working group. They should, you know, identify and support um, major new revenues to help support um, the spending level for traditional public services, like I said, uh, roads, uh, uh, you know, teachers, um, uh, uh, those uh, important public services, as well as dividends. And I think that one dangerous trend that I is becoming more and more clear is that there's an attempt to try to push the costs off in the future, as Rick Halford has suggested, and say, well, hey, we have so much money now, let's just spend it now um, and, and, you know, not have to uh, deal with recurring revenues. The people who have to pay the lowest taxes in the United States by you know, any measure – and there needs to be um, an understanding, and I agree with both Rick and Brad, that we have to have, um, uh, you know, obviously, watch our expenditures. We're not going to have to solve the through big budget cuts. We need major new revenues um, to support the spending of public services the last month want, um, and for dividends, which I think is an important and critical program, and I have written a lot more about than anybody else. Um, so those are my views, and, and we need leadership, and not an attempt just to, like, um, force the problem on future Alaskans, um, you know, the, the people who will be here in 20 or 30 years. And by the way, I'm watching my diet and doing exercises um, to try to maximize my chances of making it to the year uh, uh, 2040 or 2050 myself. And I hope, that, and I particularly hope that all Alaskans who want to make it to Alaska in 2040 or 2050 have to be a good place, recognize that it's not a good idea to sacrifice the future for short term men. So, so Cliff. I hope that's a good answer, and I'm going to have to. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, all right. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, Cliff Grow was at the airport catching a plane, um, so uh, we had to let him go. Um, so, uh, Rick, let me turn back to you. Your reaction to his ideas, um, and I wanted to get to a question with Cliff about what he would like to see for uh, an increase in oil taxes. What do you think oil taxes should look like? Well, the, the system that we started with and that the investments were made based on and the, everything else, uh, Governor Hammond used to talk about one-third, one-third, one-third. And that was one-third of the state is the owner of the oil that's being exported, uh, one-third to the producers, and one-third was going to go to the federal government because at that time the federal government had a uh, windfall profits tax. Federal share went down, uh, everything changed, but we're – way, way under the state's one-third of the value, and we have been for years. Uh, industry advocates talk about uh, all the oil tax changes. Well, most of them have been reductions. And then the credits uh, at one point engulfed all the taxes and a huge amount of the royalty. Uh, and we still have the deductible credits uh, descending, and we still have some 
what people consider a liability for the payable credits, although they're all held by uh, uh, mostly bottom feeders in the economic market. But the, the bottom line is that the industry pays less here than they pay anywhere else. They probably pay less here to the state than they agree to pay in the uh, uh, non-state uh, small production areas that belong to native corporations. Uh, the the uh, industry can be a significant contributor. They're not. All right. We need to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll continue our discussion about ideas for the best path forward for Alaska's fiscal stability and protection of the permanent fund as Talk of Alaska continues statewide. Today's program is underwritten in part by ConocoPhillips, investing in oil exploration and production and working to create economic opportunities for Alaskans. ConocoPhillips, unlocking Alaska's energy resources. Welcome back to Talk of Alaska. We're discussing the best path forward for Alaska's financial security and, uh, by extension, the residents of the state. You can join our conversation at 1-800-478-8255. That's the number statewide, 1-800-478-8255. If you're in Anchorage, the local number is 550-8422, 550-8422. We have heard from early in the program, we had uh, Andrew Kitchenman, our state government, Alaska Public Media and KTOO state government reporter on to kind of set the scene for us about what's happening in the fourth special session. We also heard from Cliff Groh, an, an attorney and a member of Alaska Common Ground. And um, currently on the line with us are Brad Keithley. Brad is an attorney and managing director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. And Rick Helford, former Republican Senate leader and a member of the Permanent Fund Defenders Group. We're going to go to the phones for just a moment. Um, we have someone in Fairbanks named Stone. Hello. Stone? Hello, Stone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yep. Yep. Since birth, I got that my whole life. No one believes me. Um, but uh, I, I uh, hi. I'm in Fairbanks. My family came up from the Midwest in the Palmer Colony, and then my grandparents had a homestead in Wasilla, and then now I'm up here. But what I'm wondering is um, how much more money would be in the PFD? Because uh, it's my understanding that the PFD fund has loaned billions of dollars to the state, and I'm wondering how much more the, the dividend payments would be, how much more the investments would be, if that had never been loaned out. Uh, and then also then how, how is that going to be paid back, as we're discussing. Uh, and I wonder about, it's my understanding of the Constitution, that out-of-state residents, uh, they're like exempt from an extra tax or like any discriminatory tax against them. And uh, they're taking a huge amount of wealth out of this this state. And I think, as we were talking about earlier on the radio, climate change is going to affect us. And I think we need to insulate our economy much more because we're we, we're completely dependent on these multinational corporations and uh, shipping lanes. That if they ever have issues, um, I, I don't know. That it, uh, that is what I'm wondering about. How's it going to be paid back? How much more would it have been invested? All right. Thank you, Stone, for the call. Um, there's a couple issues here. First, uh, Stone's question about, um, and uh, Rick, maybe I'll turn to you to answer this. He had a question about the state borrowing money from the permanent fund. I have not heard of that. Can you comment? I have not heard of that either, and I don't know exactly what he's referring to. If he's referring to the the using of the of the money in the last four or five years, that's a different question. And I think anybody that thinks those are loans is uh, is pretty naive. Uh, the state intends to spend uh, the income of the permanent fund, and that's what uh, this debate is all about, as to how it can be reconnected to the people of Alaska, how we can deal with inflation. 
uh, protect against bad investments. And uh, that's the reason that people look to the con- Constitution. And, and Stone also raised the idea of uh, taxes and income tax. Um, it's my understanding you can't have an income tax that only targets uh, one particular group. If you have an income tax, it's going to have to be for resident Alaskans and also people who come here and make money. Isn't, isn't that correct? Mm-hmm. Yes, but you can do things with uh, credits. You can you can do quite a bit to capture outside tax uh, tax income, and in some ways relieve uh, in-state income. It may be possible to to, for example, create a tax credit for property taxes on your home uh, that can be deducted from a state income tax. Uh, just as you can do a sales tax on a seasonal basis and pick up uh, more income outside than inside. But uh, you, know, you have to be willing to figure out those ways to do it. But uh, a huge amount of income in the state of Alaska is going outside, and it's totally untaxed. And when you go to the regressive permanent fund dividend tax 100% of it is paid by Alaskans and only Alaskans, and a huge percent of it is paid for by the low end of the economic spectrum. Brad, I want to bring you back in here now. First, uh, your thoughts about oil taxes and how we compare to other oil producing states, what you think should happen there, uh, and then we could talk about uh, some other types of revenue. Well, I was an advocate of SB 21 in uh, in 2014. I think Rick and I debated that on a program at one point, um, and I think it was the or 2013. It was the I think it was the right move to make us to make Alaska uh, more competitive. We had lost our competitive position uh, from uh, uh, through a period of, of high oil investment uh, from 20, 2008 to 2013 14. And we'd lost that position. I think SB 21 was a good adjustment to put us back in. However, since that time, there have been additional changes in the world. Um, and, uh, and one of those changes was the 2017 Federal uh, tax, uh, uh, tax Act uh, that significantly cut corporate income taxes. Rick's right. The original concept of, the, of, of Governor Hammond and of, of those who looked at the oil resource was a third of the state, a third of the companies, a third of the federal government. And the tax act, the, the 2017 tax act, federal tax act, significantly backed down even further uh, the federal government's share. All of that has gone to the companies uh, since that time. So I think there's adjustments that can be, that should be made to the to the oil tax that do not threaten our competitive position. I know the oil companies will tell us that they do, but do not threaten our competitive position and, and sort of restore the equity, the, the, the competitiveness that we tried to instill um, uh, in 2014. Because of that, I was, a, I was an advocate of the uh, of, uh, Proposition 1, was it? Uh, the oil tax, uh, or two, whichever one it was, the oil tax on the, on the last ballot. I think there need to be, I think there do need to be adjustments. All right, let's go to the phones for just a moment. Uh, we have on the line Senator Shelley Hughes. Hello, Senator. Good morning. Good morning. Happy to join you. Yes, I was originally going to be on this show, and then not knowing what was going to be happening today in Juneau, I couldn't commit, but we're just having a technical. So I thought I would call in. I listened at the beginning when Andrew uh, laid things out, and I just want to um, maybe provide a little more insight for your listeners and correct a couple things uh, because um, Andrew indicated that there are folks that are aligned with the governor's agenda who want a constitutional amendment. Um, That may be true, but there are a number of people who are not aligned with the governor's agenda on many fronts that also want a constitutional amendment. In fact, Senator Tom Begich believe that in the Senate we could get 14 votes to settle the PSD and and provide certainty for the future. Uh, I was part of the fiscal plan working group, and it was a fascinating experience to bring eight people together from across the state and across the political spectrum. And in close to 200 hours worth of uh, meetings, phone calls, text messages, uh, follow-up, we came together over that period and there are uh, there are some
some things that we didn't fully settle, like whether the uh, 50-50 PFD would begin right away or it would be down the road. So that is one open. But I wanted to mention, he mentioned that um, some of the Republicans are aligned with the governor wanting $500 million in revenue and others want $700 million. And I just wanted to say, I don't. Th- I think the governor actually wants to try to do it without any extra revenue or very little extra revenue um, by taking a larger additional draw out of the um, permanent fund to help bridge the gap. Um, what we recommended was um, 500 to 200 million, million, depending on the uh, number of uh, reductions that could be achieved over the next couple of years. Now, one thing that's happened is oil prices have got, been um, up fairly nicely recently, which can help by hundreds of millions of dollars as far as uh, helping fill that gap. But that doesn't mean we can kick the can down the road. And I just want to say we're here in this fourth special session. There's extreme frustration um, on the parts of many, and it's no secret that uh, you can look at, at our daily schedule. There's nothing There's nothing scheduled right now in Senate finance. And I respect um, Senator Burt Stedman, the finance co-chair, and Senator Click um, Bishop, the the other co-chair. They're not actually supporting the fiscal plan working group's recommendations, and so they have not scheduled things. Mm. Um, But that's a problem because the majority of the Senate actually would like to move things forward. And um, so we're in this place where... It's in the hands of the finance co-chairs that things aren't moving along. And so we're having discussions of how, how to handle that and what to do. And it's also no secret there have been conversations of, of realignment and reorganizing the Senate as a possibility. I don't know that that's going to happen. But um, we're trying to figure out a way because it is our job. It is our job to fix the problem. It is our job to solve the problem. And I'm going to throw out something, and then I'll be quiet, that I am very concerned about, that if the legislature does not do its job, how will the voters vote in November of 2022 in regard to holding a state constitutional convention? I think they will vote to hold a state constitutional convention if we don't do our job. That's a very risky thing to open up our Constitution. So I think it is our responsibility to stop kicking the can down the road, take the recommendations of the fiscal plan working group and start to hammer them out the best that we possibly can and um, begin to do the right thing to do our job as the legislature. All right. Thank you, Senator Hughes. And uh, um, you uh, have reflected the thoughts of at least one of the emails that we got uh, about a constitutional convention. Um, This is from a listener in Eagle River that said, Good morning. I'd like to ask the panel, are they aware that many Alaskans plan to promote a constitutional convention vote in 2022 if there is no fair and sustainable PFD and budget plan with immediate progress in the next session? Um, This person writes, A huge number of Alaska voters on the right uh, will not, and says not represented by this panel, will not tolerate more of the same stalling on decisions and regressive PFD tax by politicians. We're going to take another very short break, and when we come back, we'll bring our guests back in to comment on what we've just heard as Talk of Alaska continues. Talk of Alaska is brought to you in part by your local public radio station. Everyone is excited for the 2021-2022 school year. It's important to prepare for an active year ahead, whether you play competitive sports or just enjoy being active. It's important to make your overall health a priority. So get your COVID-19 vaccine, stay active and involved, check in with friends and family, and bounce back from COVID together and make it a great year. This message sponsored by the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services. Welcome back to Talk of Alaska. We heard from Senator Shelley Hughes, and uh, also we've got some email comments in here, people saying that uh, there is one person writes in, there's tons of recorded testimony out there against the government thinking they know how to better spend the PFD than the people. If you think the mass of Alaskans have the same opinion, then why is putting it out to a vote such a problem? Um, I would like to go back to the phones just for a moment before we return to our guests and get the comments of another Alaskan. This is David in Anchorage. Hello. Good morning. 
morning, Lori, uh, Rick, and uh, Brad, I guess it is. Uh, first, all of you, thanks for participating in this uh, this conversation is obviously a very important topic. I did hear Brad say that, you know, while he was initially a supporter of SB 21, you have to pay attention, you know, year after year to changing circumstances. And in 2017, we had a, a 40% cut in the corporate tax rate from 35 to 21%. And none of that came over to um, Alaskans. And that obviously you have to pay attention to proper fiscal management of our Prudhoe Bay fields. Rick Halford was a supporter of the Alaska Fair Shares Act, um, which was on the ballot. That was the oil tax measure, I think, on last year's ballot that Brad was referring to. And 145,000 Alaskans voted yes on that at $40 oil. We're now at $80 oil. We don't have to reinvent the wheel each year. Um, but my, my general thought would be to both panelists, what about just um, one, of, one of the provisions of the Fair Share Act was just transparency, basic public records. We're not aware of any other owners of a similar resource that generates you know, billions of dollars of wealth annually that doesn't have a full public record status or transparency to uh, its oil. So that's what I would propose, is no one can really talk uh, knowingly, either a legislator or a governor or you know, fiscal um, writers or economists, if you don't have access to just, just the basic records of costs and profits and and expenses. All right. Uh, thank you, David, for the call. Uh, Rick, Rick Halford, do you want to respond? Well, he makes a very good point, and he's absolutely right. Uh, we all learn over time, and unless we recognize that uh, we've been wrong in the past, we we never really can can work through that. But years ago, we had a separate accounting provision that really uh, provided the uh, separation of vertically integrated uh, companies from being able to move profits up and down the, the chain and do everything else. And we gave that away uh, in, uh, it was in court, we gave it away, and separate accounting would give us exactly what uh, you really need to be able to manage a public resource. We don't have it. Uh, I voted in favor of repealing that law. I was wrong. History has proven that, and uh, we should go back to separate accounting. All right. Uh, Brad, anything you want to follow up with there, or else I'd, I've got plenty of other questions to move to? <laughs> well, I, I, would, I would simply say yes. I, was, I supported the, the, the ballot proposition the last time out. I, I included in that is the provision that talked about more transparency. I think that's fair and an appropriate thing to do. But here, but here's a point that I think people need to consider. You can't increase oil taxes enough to close the deficit. I mean, oil taxes are not the silver bullet that's going to that's going to solve this problem. Uh, and and yes, we need to adjust oil taxes. As I said before, there's been changes since 2014 that we need to take into account, and we need to adjust oil taxes, but that's not, a clo not going to close the deficit. And we're not going to get this problem solved until we address who's going to pay to close uh, the remainder of the deficit. As long as people are pointing fingers at each other, it ends up – the default ends up being PFD cuts. It ends up being middle- and lower-income Alaska families that end up paying it. We've got to solve that problem. Frankly, I think once we solve that, everything else tumbles out. People will look at oil taxes and say, hey, you know, the oil companies need to pay a larger share based upon the changes since 2014. Here's the data to do that. But we've got – we can't think of that as, as the silver bullet that's going to solve everything. We, we've been talking about so many different elements here, um, and I want to make sure that I'm clear about your both of your thoughts on what the governor has proposed. Um, <clears throat> he wants uh, more money for, for permanent fund dividends, some sort of a supplemental. Uh, he hasn't proposed any uh, major taxes, also wants spending cuts, but has not proposed any. Uh, the governor wants to take a, a one-time $3 billion extra draw from permanent fund earnings to cover the shortfall for the next couple of years. Um, uh, Republican House Speaker Louise Stutes from Kodiak um, said, you know, she'd, she said she would love to say, yeah, let's have a big PFD, but where are the spending cuts going to come from? How are you going to pay for a big PFD? Show us if you want spending cuts. Show us how you're going to provide for those. And the governor's response 
was, hey, the permanent fund is $81 billion, so we can afford the extra $3 billion draw right now. And he called that uh, a solution. Um, Rick, do you agree with the one-time draw, and do you think that is a solution, or is it a Band-Aid? Uh, it's, it's much worse than a solution. It's much worse than a Band-Aid. It's, uh, it's a significant injury to the future. But there are other sources the governor could use to do that. You know, the overcapitalization of ADA could pay that uh, and not lose the necessary capital to do the uh, the things that were originally in ADA's purpose. Uh, AHFC has uh, huge overcapitalization. They also could contribute. You don't have to just go to the people's savings account to deal with a short-term transition. You have other resources to do that. So, although, I mean, I agree with trying to get back to the formula. That's a, a basic tenet of uh, uh, the defenders of the permanent fund, that the dividend is an, is an important piece of it. It needs to be in the Constitution. But to get there, we have other resources than overdrawing the permanent fund itself. What are you saying? I mean, if you're taking money from ADA or HFC, we're talking about billions that the governor has proposed drawing. We're not going to get billions from either one of those, correct? Uh, the excess in ADA is uh, close to the to one year to pick that up. Uh, the excess in AHFC is also. Uh, there's there's huge amounts of money that were in overcapitalization when both of those things were uh, in a very different situation. It goes all the way back to the Hammond years. Hammond was not a supporter of putting a lot of money in those things, but he had uh, a provision that unless the legislature appropriated uh, the total subsidy required in those huge loans in the early 80s, uh, the, uh, he would veto the, the authorization. And uh, as a result, we put hundreds of millions of dollars into those organizations. And, and uh, before I move back to Brad, uh, and forgive me if you already commented here and I, I uh, uh, missed it, but your thoughts about a constitutional convention, do you think that there should be one held or do you prefer to see uh, amendments to the Constitution made through legislation and votes by Alaskans? I think a constitutional convention is uh, a very, very dangerous approach. I think it should be done by individual amendments. You know, the Constitutional Convention isn't just uh, uh, the, the, the section that calls for the vote uh, is followed by a section that says it can't in any way be limited. And I think that's a very dangerous position to be in. All right. Thank you. Uh, Brad Keithley, I want to get back to you now. Your thoughts about what the governor's proposed. Um, is it a solution or a Band-Aid? Oh, it's a Band-Aid, and, and frankly, Rick's uh, proposals of, uh, of taking down the Capitol and H HFC and ADA is a, is a Band-Aid also. They're all one-time draws uh, of capital. If you look at the futures market, the oil futures market, uh, we're, we're at a high right now, but those prices, the futures market tell us, tells us those prices start going back down, and by the middle of the decade, uh, we're back down to where we were pre-COVID. The, the the kinks in the system that are causing the current spikes uh, work out, and we're back down to where we are pre-COVID. The the governor the governor is assuming that oil prices. If you look at the at the spring revenue forecast that he's using as a basis, the governor is assuming that oil prices continue to go up. That we're in the high 70s by uh, by the time we get to the end of the decade. The futures market is telling us we're back in the in the high 50s by the by the end of the decade. So it's we, we should not be doing these one-time band-aids. Yes, it may look okay for next year. Yes, it might even look okay for the year after that. Uh, if you draw it from the ERA or you draw it from AHFC or you draw it from ADA, but but that that is just a temporary band-aid that's masking the real problem. We're right back into it worse off because we've drained that capital. We've just drained another savings account. Worse off uh, and we and we hit it again. We need to solve this problem uh, uh, by by stepping up to the plate and understanding that we're going to have to pay for uh, this. The Alaskans are going to have to pay something uh, toward the cost of government, 
and we need to step up and decide who pays, and we need to do that on the basis of what has the lowest adverse impact uh, to the Alaska economy and what's most equitable for Alaska families. Well, in our in our last minute here, um, as you were referencing a minute ago, prices are in the 80s right now, but um, we'll probably drop back down. Have The permanent fund is generating more income than oil now, so is it possible that we've passed kind of a tipping point for what can realistically be gleaned from oil that will be... Um, meaningful amounts going forward. Um, you know, uh, prices are high now. They will probably drop back down. But how should people think about how our revenue stream has changed from all hail oil to the permanent fund uh, income? Well, I, uh, oil will continue to play a role, whether it, it won't play the historic role of providing 80 percent of, of UGF, unrestricted general fund revenues, but it will compla- continue to play a significant role. If the investments in Willow are made, if the investments in the PICA project are made, we will continue to have oil production. We will continue to have uh, oil revenues. You just can't count on it being the, the, the solution uh, uh, to, to, to the problem, either through taxation or through increased revenue or through increased prices, as, as the governor does. But it'll, it'll play a role. But we need to step back and say, look, individual Alaskans are going to have to play a role also. And they're playing that role currently through PFD cuts that hit middle and lower income Alaska families the hardest. Mm-hmm. We, need to find a more, we need to find a more equitable way for them to play that role. And uh, Rick, your final thoughts here in our last 30 seconds or so. Well, I agree with that assessment. You're never going to get uh, the downward pressure that you have in every other jurisdiction in the country on spending if there's no contribution that that spending comes from. And when the contribution comes from the bottom end of the economic spectrum that has the least influence, that has the least pushback on excess spending. So even if it's a small part of the solution or whatever size part of the solution is, uh, having a stake in the outcome through the economic spectrum is important to the overall balance. Are you uh, optimistic that some resolve will happen during this special session? I am hopeful. Optimistic would be an overstatement. And Brad, your thoughts? No, not during the special session. I, we, we've got I mean, the legislature is is so evenly d- d- divided. We're going to have to go through another election, the 2022 election, frankly, to to get some clarity on this. And and hopefully we do in the 2022 election. But uh, the legislature, I mean, even if the Senate passed something, the House wouldn't. Um, so we're just going to have to we're going to have to go through another cycle of elections. I don't think the solution is a constitutional convention. I agree with Rick that that's just a Pandora's box that we open. All right. Well, thank you so much to my guests today. We heard from Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Media and KTOO state government reporter at the top of the show. We also heard from Cliff Grow, an attorney and a member of Alaska Common Ground earlier today. And uh, on the line with us until the end of the show were Brad Keithley, an attorney and managing director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, and Rick Halford, a former Republican Senate leader and member of the Permanent Fund Defenders Group. Thanks to our engineer, Tobin Shelby, and our producer, Adlin Baxter. On the phones today, Kavitha George. I'm Lori Townsend. We'll be back next week. Thanks for listening. Talk of Alaska is a production of Alaska Public Media, which is solely responsible for its content. Views expressed are those of the participants and not necessarily those of Alaska Public Media, this station, or its underwriters. Today's program is available online at alaskapublic.org. This is Alaska Public Media. Alaska Public Media.